Hi, welcome to the Bendigo Talk series. Today we're going to be talking about the Diagum Sands Chinese history in Bendigo. My name's Catherine, I'm from City of Greater Bendigo. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that the City of Greater Bendigo is on Zha Zha Rung and Tungurung country. I would like to acknowledge and extend my appreciation to the Zha Zha Rung people, the traditional owners of the land that we are standing on today. Today we pay our respects to leaders and elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of all Zha Zha Rung peoples. As I said, my name's Catherine. I'm the Major Events Coordinator with City of Greater Bendigo and my principal role is to coordinate our annual Bendigo Easter Festival. I'd like to introduce our panel here today. First of all, I'll start with Dennis. Hello, I'm Dennis O'Hoy. I'm here to represent the Bendigo Just House Temple I'm Hugo Leshen, the Chief Executive Officer of the Golden Dragon Museum, and out the front of the museum you can see a pine tree to Dennis's family and indeed to other Louis families as well when you come to visit. Hi, I'm Doug, Doug Lagoon, uh, President of Bendigo Chinese Association and Chair of the Golden Dragon Museum. Uh, like Dennis, I'm also a Louis clan member and I'm a third generation descendant. Today we have the privilege of meeting here at the Golden Dragon Museum to discuss the Chinese history of Bendigo. Dennis, can you tell us a little bit about how your family came to Bendigo? So when my grandfather came here in 1894, he brought my father out and the Ohoys had a business here, Sanak Goon. It was the central hub for all the Chinese community in central Victoria. So father actually sold a lot of goods, not only to the Chinese, but to the Europeans. So it was a sad day for the Ahoy family in 1964 when my father died and subsequently the business was demolished. But on this site is the Golden Dragon Museum. So although we lost some beautiful old buildings which went back to the old gold rush days of the 1850s, it's terrific that the Golden Dragon Museum is built on this site. When gold was first discovered here in Bendigo in 1851, the word got around and by 1854 the Chinese were coming to Bendigo Goldfields and the rest of Victoria. Interesting, Bendigo's Chinese name is Dai Gum San. Dai is big, gum, gold, big gold mountain. So if you are in a village in China, particularly around the Toy San area, and you hear about gold being picked off the creeks and streets, everybody want to come here, Dai Gum San. Great name, Big Gold Mountain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it would certainly bring me yeah. out. Um, and I think in the gold fields altogether, there was something like 35 or 40,000 know, spread across Victoria. But uh, you know, I think there was you know, three and a half, four thousand of them came to Bendigo um, to here to seek their fortune in the gold. And, and they were they were very successful as gold miners. 200,000 ounces of gold actually went back to Canton. So, mm -hmm. so I suppose. Remnants is the wrong word, but now you can see that you know what what we have here in Bendigo today. Of course, is is part of that long history of the Chinese here in Bendigo. My family didn't come from Canton at all, <laughs> um, but but I'm I'm late to the story. My my job is to look after the collection and the um, elements of the Golden Dragon Museum. There are three uh, key elements across the precinct. There's the museum where we are now. There are some beautiful gardens based on gardens from the Forbidden City in Beijing. And then there's a very small yet perfectly formed temple to the Chinese Goddess of Mercy. So we're very privileged to have not only a museum full of extraordinary treasures, which we'll talk about no doubt, but some beautiful gardens and a beautiful temple as well. Mm. It's definitely very serene over in the gardens. It is. I've been over there myself. The amazing thing, Catherine, is that the forebears, Dennis's and Doug's forebears, kept all their ritual and processional material. Um, and it's, it's that which forms the core of the, of the museum's collection. So if they hadn't kept that material, we wouldn't have the dragons, the regalia, the costumes and, and the musical instruments and many of the documents that we have in the 30 odd thousand um, object collection. So my role is to work with the Bendigo Chinese Association and with Doug and the um, Bendigo Chinese community to help tell their stories, drawing on this collection that has the whispers, if you like, of what, what has gone on in the past. And we can then learn so much, not only about the past, but also the future. Mm. 
And so you say the collection we have here, would it have come over traditionally from China when people came over and migrated or was it brought over for a particular reason? The first procession kicked off in 1971. Burnside and Aspinall realised that the Chinese would have a festival on Chinese New Year. So they invited the Chinese to participate to bring their processional regalia here. So this festival, which is unique to Bendigo, happens every Easter and it has made the procession something worthwhile of seeing here in Bendigo. The first recorded um, appearance of a dragon was in 1892. Ever since there's been dragons in, in parade in Bendigo at Easter. Um, you've mentioned the dragons. Was there a history as to the commissioning of the original Lung when yes. it came out? In 1892, to actually expand the procession, all the Chinese that lived in Bendigo and the region were asked to donate money so Lung, which means dragon in Chinese, was commissioned to be built in Fusan. All these items, Lung, banners, costumes, everything was beautifully made and has been kept, when you think from 1892 up to the present day in this museum. The embroideries are world class. Benigo has kept a lot, which you can see all around us here. And then when was it decided, we were just noting earlier, that Lung had a longer history than um, Sun Lung and then Dai Gum Lung. Uh, was there a reason why Lung was around for so long and then we brought Sun Lung out? Was there a decision that was made? Actually, the original Dragon 1892, is, it's described in the Benigo advertisement at the time as being something unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and the original Dragon 1892 preceded Lung, but that dragon doesn't actually exist anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Lung obviously came a bit late and Lung had a very had a fantastic history from the point of view of not only appearing in Bendigo but you know, travelled to Sydney and Pachuca and, and other places and the Chinese have a very good way of making do with things and, uh, and they made do with Lung, Lung for a very long, long time but then in, uh, in I think it was 1969 or slightly prior the Lung 100 committee was formed which was a group of local businessmen knowing that Lung was sort of had seen better days to put together a, a fundraising effort to to bring uh, a new dragon to Bendigo, Sun Lung. It's interesting if you read the citation, Lung is um, registered on the Victoria Heritage Register. It actually makes comment that part of its heritage value is that it was used by the Chinese community for so many years and repaired and restored after many of the uses. So as Doug's just said, Almost nothing was thrown out. It was, it was literally patched up and reused and reused. So what we have now is the oldest processional dragon probably in the world. Is Dai Gum Lung the longest dragon in the world? The Dai Gum Lung is the longest traditionally made and in the imperial style. And, and there's always a bit of a debate about what's an imperial dragon now. Lung, of course, was made in the period of, of an emperor, um, but it's all individually individually handmade scales and, and the traditions of Sun Lung built and appearing in 1970 and Dai Gum Lung built and appearing in 2019, the, tra the making traditions are, are virtually exactly the same. So, so we refer to them as imperial dragons because they're, they're, they're befitting of an emperor. Lung, actually Sun Lung was extended by another 30 odd metres and we never used to say exactly how long it was, we used to say it was over 100 metres long. And, and probably now everybody knows it's probably about 103 metres long, but um, it was the longest, yeah, longest imperial dragon. I did yeah. not know he was extended. I thought he came out. Well, that was part of the friendly competition between yeah. Bendigo and Melbourne. Melbourne had died long, mm -hmm. big long, but we weren't going to let Melbourne have a bigger one, so we actually purchased a few more feet to extend him. And it's interesting too, if you look at the dragons, it has five claws, and if you have five claws, that means imperial. So all our dragons have five claws. Sun Lung was probably paraded, well, it's hard to imagine, but you know, it was probably paraded fairly vigorously over, you know, ver verging on 50 years. So yeah, so now we have a, a magnificent Dai Gum Lung, big, big golden dragon, which is about 125 metres long. At any one time, it used to take 56 people to carry Sun Lung. It's, I think it's 72 now with with, uh, with Dai Gum Lung and, and probably in all aspects Dai Gum Lung is about 20% bigger lengthwise, size-wise, weight-wise and stuff like that. So the traditional term for Dai Gum Lung, is he an imperial dragon or is he a golden dragon? Well, I say this, this has caused some debate. 
the you know the traditionally it was always been you know uh, the dragon was you know perceived to be male and ca and carried by male. So we took the uh, decision um, back when Diagram Long was being um, uh, manufactured or, and, and the project was coming to fruition that that Diagram Long would be able to be carried by women uh, and, and that was the case and it was you know it was done quite successfully in 2019 so that will continue. Uh, you know it's very traditional like traditional traditionally made um, but then some traditions evolve and this is and this is one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I might just add that what's in particularly interesting from a museum's point of view is that for most of the year we look after the dragons and they're here, they're asleep, um, eating their pomelo leaves and there's a whole history around that. Um, but we, we do the whole white glove thing that museums do. Then once or twice a year the community comes in, grabs our dragons, in, in the case of Dagam Lung, 70 people come in the dragon is, is firstly awakened, um, then 70 people come in, they grab the dragon, they take him out the front doors, and they parade him down the streets of Bendigo. Now, in a museological sense, that would be like taking Farlap out of the Museum in Victoria and taking the horse down Swanston Street. From a museum point of view, it is absolutely gobsmacking and quite terrifying. And then they turn around and bring the dragons back and, and, and ritually put them back to sleep. It's fantastic because it means that the history of this place, the history of the collection continues. I know the awakening of the dragon that we do every Easter as part mm. of the Benny Goes to Festival is amazing and it's spectacular every year. But you mentioned the leaves in the dragon's mouths. What's the significance of those? The experts can correct me. My understanding is um, Chinese dragons, unlike Western dragons, are, are herbivores. They eat pomelo leaves. And a pomelo is a large sort of oversized grapefruit. We have some pomelo trees. You can see them in the temple and there's one in the garden. The dragons eat the leaves. And so when they're put to sleep, um, you, it's important to feed your dragon. And so there are some pomelo leaves uh, on the tongues of all of our dragons. Another adject to the procession are the Chinese lion teams. They're fantastic what they do, climbing up poles and jumping from one unit to another. Oh, they're just, they're just incredible. Our lion teams here are, are, are fantastic um, ambassadors for our city. They're, they travel, you know, up to the northwest, they travel up the northeast, and you know, and obviously help uh, down in Melbourne at Luna Newry as well. Uh, but they're they're very highly regarded. The lion uh, performances are a great part of the association, and also our plum blossom uh, cultural dance team, who who uh, who participate, you know, alongside the lion team at those events as well. Interesting here in Bendigo, it's very unique. Back in 2005 at Pepper Green Farm. They were doing some work and luckily the bulldozer, the fellow was driving it, struck this brick in the soil. David Benny, who's the state archaeologist of this area, decided to have a look and what was discovered was a Chinese kiln built by a Fox Xing. It was built in 1857, to be correct and we uncovered the front of the kiln, which is a long tunnel going up the hill. And interesting, the bricks that were made at this kiln, you can still see the work here in Bendigo. So you have a Chinese kiln with Chinese bricks here in Bendigo, quite unique. One other key component we have in Bendigo is the Joss House Temple. And um, was that the only temple that was built here or was it the only remaining temple? Catherine, right up my alley. <laughs> 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 well, of course, of all ethnic groups, people have religion and the Chinese have three mainstays, Confucianism, Buddhism and Taoism. A Joss House is really a temple, a house of worship, a church if you wish to call it. At Emu Point, there were at least eight Chinese Joss Houses but over the years there were fires and decrease of population, they disappeared. So of the eight Chinese temples, the one that we have here is the original. In 1968, I started to plan the restoration of the temple, the Joss House, 
and raise the money, which we did. And the 19th of April, 1972, we opened the Joss House, which still, by the way, is open now for people to worship. And it's terrific. Uh, every weekend we get people from all parts of Victoria coming to pray. I work there every Saturday looking after the fish in the gardens. So I'm very happy to be there. So look, it's another part of uh, Chinese history when you think there's only two temples left in Victoria. It's a real temple and it's great that we're able to preserve and run it. It's, it's worth a visit. Mm. I was um, taken back by how small it was. I thought it would be bigger um, myself. Can you explain the size oh, the, of it? Look, the, the, the All Nations Temple, which was just a few metres away from it, was much larger. Uh, it's interesting. It is small. There's only the main temple, the caretakers, and the ancestral hall where plaques are placed there to remember people that have gone. But it's a wonderful spirit. Look, it's got a terrific karma. Uh, when people come there, particularly kids, they see the fish pond, which I'm very proud of, by the way. It's got this karma. People come away feeling at ease. It's so restful. So we've spoken about the dragons uh -huh. and everything here at the museum. Are there any other key pieces that we have here at the Golden Dragon Museum that's significant to Bendigo? Um, yes, is the short answer. There's a wonderful collection, the St Alban collection, which was um, largely donated several years ago. And it's from that collection that we get some terrific ceramics, some amazing metalware, um, and some really beautiful jade pieces, as well as some really astonishing textiles. In fact, um, it's important as a chief executive officer that I have no favorites. I, I love all the 30,000 objects equally. But should I have a favorite, um, it would probably be the textiles because they are incredibly beautiful, um, handmade, hand embroidered, often with gold bullion thread, um, that they've lasted uh, so well is a, a credit to the um, community and the people who've looked after them. Uh, so they're on display and people can come and see them here. There's um, a wonderful collection of Chinese currency that dates back to um, earlier than 200 BCE, the Hori Bridges collection, which is just in, in a wooden um, display case, you pull the drawers out. Uh, and then there's this extraordinary uh, jade chariot that was never actually uh, for riding in. Um, it's too small for, for many of us um, and it's too fragile for all of us. Uh, so it's a ceremonial piece, uh, but it's, it's one of the highlights of the museum here. So whilst we're focused on the dragons and their regalia, and they are fabulous, there are many, many other things to come and see. I would also encourage people, and this is a, a, a bit of a, a personal thing, we have, interestingly, over 300 pairs of shoes. Um, now, shoes are shoes are for shoes. For sale or just no, for No, 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 in the collection, in the collection. <laughs> shoes tell a very interesting story about the people who wear them. If you think there are children's shoes, there are shoes of workers, there are shoes of, of wealthy, richer, more prosperous people, and of course there are some shoes in the collection that were man, are made for uh, women with bound feet. Um, and so shoes tell a very particular story. So when you come to the Golden Dragon Museum, see the dragons, see the jade chariot, see the textiles, but also please look, look at some of the smaller things because the big and the glittery are fabulous, but it's some of the smaller things that are also wonderful, wonderful treasures. I mean, the museum, it is very special to the you know, local Chinese and, and, and obviously the, the, the core story to the museum is te tells the history of the Bendigo Chinese, where they came from, you know, what was, the, what was their ordeals or, and their, their trials and tribulations through the gold rush. But if I take, if I look at, you know, what it was in my favourite piece, there is a piece out of St Alban collection, an imperial dragon throne, uh, which just fascinates me to no end to thinking who actually sat on it. And to me, that one is really unique. Yeah. Hey, well, that, that's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, so that's all we have time for today. I uh, wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Thanks Dennis, Hugo and Doug for coming along today. Um, I grew up in Bendigo myself. I understood we had a rich Chinese history, but I've certainly learned something today and I really appreciate you coming along. Um, thank you everyone for watching us. Please join us here in Bendigo and visit our Chinese heritage sites sometime soon. You won't be disappointed. And this was our Bendigo talk series of our Chinese history in Bendigo. Thank you. <laughs>